Chapter 6 Imagery and Trial Toward the end of the Vedic age of human life, a great discovery began to take place, a discovery unparalleled over the whole course of the history of human civilizations on the earth. People became acutely aware of the power of collective thought. And here we must clarify what exactly is the thought of man. The thought of man is an energy unparalleled anywhere in space. It is capable of creating marvelous worlds on the one hand, or on the other, weapons capable of destroying the planet. And all the matter that we see today, without exception, has been created by thought. Nature, the animal kingdom, man himself have all been created with great inspiration by the divine thought. And the proliferation of artificial objects, machines, and mechanical devices which we see today are the creations of man's thought. You may think that it is man's hand that has produced them. Yes, today hands must be employed, but to begin with, everything down to the last details created by thought. It is believed today that man's thought is more perfect now than in the past, but that is far from being the case. For each member of the Vedic civilization, it was many millions of times superior to that of modern man in terms of the speed and fullness of information involved. This can be seen in the knowledge we have taken from the past about using plants for medicines and food. But nature's devices are far more perfect and complex than anything artificial. It was not just that man summoned a whole lot of beasts to serve him. It was not just a case of defining the function of all growing things. Once he realized the power of collective thought, he found that he could use it to control even the weather, or cause springs to well up from the depths of the earth. If he were not careful in handling his thought, he could make a bird fall from the sky while in flight, or affect life on different distant stars, either to plant gardens on them or to utterly destroy them. This is no fiction, but fact, and it was all given to mankind. Everyone today knows how man, having launched himself on the path of technocracy, has been attempting to build spaceships capable of reaching the stars. People have gone to the moon, but only by wasting valuable resources and energies, and with great harm to the earth. But they have changed nothing on the moon. This kind of approach is short-sighted. It is doomed to failure, and is dangerous for everyone on the earth as well as for other planets. There is another approach which is much more effective. Through thought alone, it is possible to grow a flower on the moon, create an atmosphere capable of supporting human life plan to garden there and find oneself with one's beloved in that garden in the flesh. But before that can happen, thought must transform the whole earth into a flourishing paradise garden. And that has to be done through collective thinking. Collective thought is indeed powerful. In the whole universe, there is no energy that can interfere with its operation. Matter and today's technology are the reflection of collective thought. It is this collective thought that has invented all the mechanical devices and armaments we have today. But remember I was saying that in those Vedic times, every living man's thought had far greater power and energy than now. Objects such as rocks weighing many tons could be moved by as few as nine people gathered together. To make it easier to use collective thought for the benefit of the majority without wasting time getting a whole lot of people to congregate in one place, people invented images of various gods and began to control nature with their help. The sun god appeared in its own image. Likewise, the gods of fire, rain, love, and fertility. Everything needed for life was created by people through images on which human thought was concentrated. It performed many, many useful acts. Rain, for example, was necessary for watering the ground, and so one person directed his thought just to the image of the rain god. When rain was really essential, then a whole lot of people concentrated their energy on the image of rain. When enough energy had been accumulated in the image, the clouds gathered and the rain fell, watering the harvests. Unlimited opportunity has been given to man by the divine nature. If mankind could only overcome the temptations associated with unlimited authority and hold all the energies of the universe in perfect balance with themselves, then gardens, as the fruit of human thought, would appear in other galaxies, and man would be capable of happifying other worlds with his thought. 
What is called the age of the image was now coming into bloom. In it, man not only created, but felt himself to be a god. But then, what else could the Son of God turn out to be? In what is called the age of the image, man exists in the likeness of God and begins to create his own images. This period lasts nine thousand years, and God does not interfere in man's deeds. All the diverse energies of the universe are set in motion and actively try to seduce man. Particles of all the diverse energies of the universe are to be found in man. They exist in great numbers and play opposite roles. But all the particles of the diverse energies of the universe ought to be perfectly balanced in man, brought together in a harmonious whole. If one of these particles dominates, the rest are denigrated and their harmony is disrupted. And then, then the earth is transformed and becomes inharmonious. Images can lead people to many splendored creation, but if their inner unity is surrendered, they can also lead to annihilation. But what exactly is an image? An image is an entity of energy invented by human thought. It can be created by a single man or by several together. A clear example of the collective creation of an image may be seen in stage acting. One man describes the image on paper, while another portrays the described image on the stage. What happens to the actor who portrays the image invented? For a time, the actor exchanges his own feelings, aspirations, and desires for those inherent in the invented image. In the process, the author may change the way he walks, his facial expression, his usual clothing. In this way, the invented image acquires a temporary embodiment. The ability to create images is something only man is endowed with. The image created by man can remain in space only so long as, it's, as it is held in man's thought, either by a single man or by several at once. The greater the number of people feeding the image with their feelings, the stronger it becomes. The image created by the collective thought can possess colossal destructive or creative potential. It has a reciprocal connection with people and is capable of shaping character and behavior on the part of groups of people, both large and small, in exploiting the great possibilities they have discovered within themselves. People became carried away with creating the life of the planet, but it happened back in the early stages of the age of the image in the life of man that there were six people, just six, who found themselves unable to hold within their bodies, hearts, and minds the balance of those energies of the universe which God gave to man upon creating him. Perhaps they needed to make their appearance to test all mankind. At first, it was just in one of the six that the energy of grandeur and self-importance predominated, then in another, and then in a third, and finally in all six. They did not meet together at first, each one lived independently, but like attracts like, and they ended up concentrating their thought on how to become masters of all the people of the earth. There were six of them, and in public they referred to themselves as priests. Through the process of reincarnating themselves over the centuries, they are still living to this day. Today, all the peoples of the earth are governed by just six people. These are the priests. Their dynasties are 10,000 years old. From generation to generation, they have been transmitting their knowledge of the occult to their heirs, along with the science of imagery, which, has also partially, which was also partially known to them. They have taken great pains to hide the Vedic knowledge from other people. Among the six, there is one who is considered chief, and he is called the High Priest. Today, he considers himself to be the chief ruler of human society. Through a few sentences I have uttered, which you have recorded in your books, as well as through the reaction of many people to them, the high priest has begun to suspect who I really am. Just in case, he attempted to destroy me by using a negligible amount of power. He did not succeed. He was surprised, and he has tried again, applying a greater amount of force, still not completely convinced of who I am. Now I have uttered the word Vedras, thereby exposing myself completely. The current high priest living on the earth today is afraid even of the word Vedras. You can, imagine, you can just imagine how shaken he is, since he knows what lies behind it. Now he will muster his soldiers, bio-robots to a man. 
along with the forces of all the dark occult sciences, to bring about my termination. And he himself will be working minute by minute on a plan of annihilation. Let him do that. It means he will not have time to be busy with his other plans. You were telling me about the angry attacks in the recent press, Vladimir. Now you will see them intensify even more. And they will be even more cunning and sophisticated. You will see slander and prov provocation. provocation. You will see the whole arsenal of devices which the dark forces have been using over the millennia to bring about the devastation of our people's culture. But what you will see at the beginning is only the tip of the iceberg. Not all people can witness the occult attacks at first hand, but you will understand them. You will feel them. You will see them. Do not be afraid of them, I beg of you. What is fearsome is powerless to affect a fearless man. Whatever you see, you should forget immediately and forever. No matter how omnipotent a monster may seem, once it is forgotten, it ceases to exist altogether. This is an unusual fact, and I can tell you are doubting. Do not be hasty to give in to your doubts. Think it over calmly. After all, even a small group of people who have gathered together for the purpose of building something inevitably has a leader. We may call him a ruler. A small enterprise has an official in charge. A large enterprise has several people in charge under a chief executive officer. There are many rulers over all sorts of territories which are known by different names, provinces, regions, states, communities, republics, etc. The particular name is not important. Each nation has a ruler who is aided by a whole host of assistants. The ruler of a nation, is that the limit? That is what people often think. Does that mean nobody is governing the whole human society living on the earth? And are there no claimants wishing to ascend the throne of the earth? There have indeed been claimants. There still are. You know from recent history many names of military commanders who have tried to dominate the world by force, but not one of them has ever succeeded in taking power over the world. Whenever they found themselves close to seizing universal authority, something would inevitably happen, resulting in the destruction of both the pretender to the world dominance and his army. And the nation aspiring to world domination, which before had been considered strong and flourishing, suddenly dropped to the level of a run-of-the-mill state. That is the way it has always happened over the past 10,000 years. But why? All because there is already a secret ruler in the world and has been for a long time. He toys with nations and their rulers, along with individual people. He calls himself the High Priest of the whole earth, while his five assistants refer to themselves as priests. Consider one other fact, Vladimir. Think about how in various parts of the earth, over the millennia, wars be between people have never ceased. In every country, crime, disease, and various disasters are increasing day by day. But there has been a strict, indeed the strictest, prohibition on discussing a particular question. Is human civilization really on the path of progress? Or is human society being further degraded with each passing day? There can be but one simple answer to such a question. Only first take a look and see how the priests acquire their authority and how they have managed to maintain it to date. Their first step leading to the accomplishment of their secret purpose was the creation of the Egyptian state. The Egyptian state is more familiar than others to historians of today. But once you eliminate personal commentary and mysticism and look only at the facts, you will be able to uncover many secrets. Fact number one. History calls the Pharaoh the supreme ruler of Egypt, and the many military achievements and defeats of the Pharaoh of old have been well documented. Even today their magnificent tombs astound the imagination and prompt scholars to probe the mysteries they hold. Nevertheless, the grandeur of the pyramids distracts us from the most important secret of all. Not only were the pharaohs considered as rulers over all the people, but they were worshipped as gods. It was to them that the people turned with pleas for an auspicious crop year, pleas for rain and, and an absence of pernicious winds. 
History can tell us about many of the factual accomplishments of the pharaohs, but after learning all these historical facts, you should ask yourself, could any of the pharaohs really have been a ruler over a large nation-state, let alone a god over the people? And once you weigh all the evidence, you will realize entirely on your own that the pharaoh was nothing more than a bio-robot in the hands of the priests. Now here are the facts. They are all so known to us from history. During the age of the pharaohs, there also existed priests in magnificent temples, and one of them was the high priest. There were always several candidates for the pharaohship in training under their supervision. The priests would inculcate in the young boys whatever the priests desired, among them the notion that the pharaoh was chosen by God. Along with this, they told them that the high priest himself could hear God speaking to him in a secret temple. Later, the priests would decide which of the candidates would become the next pharaoh. And so, the day of the coronation arrived. The new pharaoh, clothed in special robes and holding the symbols of office in his hands, took his place majestically on the throne. In the eyes of the people, he was an omnip omnipotent king, a god. Only the priests knew that it was their own bio-robot that sat on the throne. And having studied the new pharaoh's character from his childhood, they knew exactly how he would rule, and they knew what gifts he would offer up to the benefit of the priesthood. There was the occasional attempt on the part of certain pharaohs to come out from under the high priest's authority, but none of them ever succeeded in becoming a free man. After all, the power of the priests was just as invisible as the pharaoh's royal robes were visible to all. You see, the priest's authority did not require any verbal proclamation or manifest communication for its enforcement. After all, in exercising their power over any individual ruler, the priests did not relent, even for a moment. And it was exercised over the masses in turn with the aid of an invented suggestions as to what constitutes the order of the universe. If only the pharaoh could have liberated himself from the images inculcated in him by the priests and reflect by himself in peace, perhaps he would have been able to become a real man. But there was no way the pharaoh could feel free himself from could free himself from the day-to-day -day cares and concerns. This had been part of the plan right from the start. And what concerns there were! Couriers, scribes, and local governors by turns brought in a daily flood of information from all over the vast nation. Situations calling for immediate solutions. And then a war would break out, absorbing the ruler's full attention. And the pharaoh would take his chariot and keep following his daily trajectories, respecting or rejecting the deeds of his subjects, often not getting enough sleep himself. The priests, on the other hand, would spend would spend his time quietly reflecting, and in this lay his greatest advantage. The priest directed his efforts to gaining single-handed control of the world as a whole, and even more than that, he meditated on how to resurrect his own world, distinct from the world God had created. And did he care in the least about the stupid boy Pharaoh, not to mention the crowds which were subject to the Pharaoh, for the priests, they were all merely toys. The priests studied the signs of imagery in secret, while the masses of people remembered less and less about the law of nature. It was these priests, Vladimir, who challenged the energy of the interaction between people and the living deity, the creations of nature, into the temples they had invented. They fed on it, the energy of the people, giving nothing in return. What had been surely clear to everyone in the age of the Vedic culture now became obscure and surreptitious. The people became stupefied, as though under hypnotic spell, and unthinkingly followed the commands in a kind of semi-sleep, and they began to destroy the world of the divine nature, while building an artificial world for the priest's benefit. The priests held their science under the sh their strictest secretive control. They did not even dare write it all down on scrolls. They invented a language of their own for communication with each other. And this is a fact you can also learn from history. They needed a different language lest someone should inadvertently overhear their conversation with each other and become party to their secrets. And so, even today, these simple truths which have now become shrouded in a cloak of secrecy are passed down to new generations of the priesthood. 
Six thousand years ago, the high priest, one of the six, decided to take control of the whole world. He reasoned as follows. There is no way I can seize power by military force with the pharaoh's armies. Even if I taught the commanders how to make use of weapons more advanced than others possess. Besides, what could an army of raving mindless dullards do? Go and plunder gold? But there is so much of that as it is. There are slaves aplenty, but there is an unfavorable energy emanating from them, and it would not be proper to accept food from the hands of a slave. The food would be savorless and harmful to health. I must bring human souls into subjection and direct all their love and tremulous affection back to myself. But in this case, it is not an army that is needed, but scientific thought, the science of imagery. That is my invisible army. The deeper I become acquainted with it, the more faithfully this army ought to serve me, the less that is known by the crowd, immersed as it is in occultism and unreality, the more it will be in subjection to me. The high priest devised his plan. Even today it finds its reflection in the historical events of the past six thousand years. You and everyone else are aware of recent events. The only difference is in their interpretation. But you should try and give your own, and then the truth will be made known to you. Look and see. There in the council of those six priests the plan was laid out, and was later revealed to many. It is mentioned in the Bible, in the Old Testament. By order of the high priest, the priest Moses led the Jewish people out of Egypt. The people were offered a most marvelous life in the promised land, prepared by God especially for them. The Jewish people were declared to be God's chosen ones. The tempting news set minds afire, and a part of the people followed Moses, who for forty years led his people about from region to region in the wilderness. The priests' assistants constantly preached sermons about their being a chosen people, and inspired the people to make war and plunder cities, all in his, God's, name. If anyone should happen to awake from his psychosis and demand a return to his former life, he was declared a sinner to be reformed and given a deadline by which he had to be reformed. If he failed to do this, he would be killed. The priests acted not in their own names, but by pretending they were carrying out the deeds of God. What am I telling you? What I am telling you is no fantasy or dream. This may be clearly seen by everyone for themselves by looking for answers in the Old Testament of the Bible a great historical book. A reliable portrayal of historical events can be learned by anyone who wakes at least a little from the millennia-old hypnotic sleep and reads how and by what means the Jewish people were programmed and turned into troops of the priesthood. Later, Jesus tried to deprogram his people and to use his manifest gift for acquiring new wisdom to prevent the priests from carrying out their designs. In his journeys among wise men, he endeavored to glean inklings into the science of imagery. And after he had learnt a great many truths, he decided to save the Jewish people, his own people. He succeeded in creating his own religion, one which could serve as a counterbalance to the terror. His religion was not for all the nations upon the earth. It was intended only for the Jewish people. He himself mentioned this more than once. His words were written down by his disciples, and you can still read them to date. See, for example, St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 15, verses 22 to 28. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. What does it mean, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel? Why are Jesus' teachings only for the Jews? Why did he consider the Jewish people to be lost? I tell you, Vladimir, Jesus knew that as a result of the 40-year programming in the Sinai wilderness, the majority of the Jewish people were lost in a hypnotic dream. This part of the people, as indeed Moses himself, thus became a tool in the hands of the high priest. 
They were his foot soldiers, whom he compelled to seize power over all the earth's people to satisfy his own vain glory. And they will be running their battles in various parts of the earth for thousands of years. Their weapons will not be primitive swords or bullets, but cunning and the creation of a way of life subject to all subjecting all the world's people to occultism, in other words, to the selfishness of the priests, and they will do whatever it takes. But any battle presupposes the presence of two opposing sides, you may well be thinking, and if so, then where are the victims? In any battle, there have to be victims on both sides. You could probably find evidence of these battles yourself through searching by the dates mentioned in the various historical sources. But to make it easier for you to locate these fearful dates, I shall cite just a few of them right now. If you wish, you can look up their historical confirmation for yourself. Everybody knows today, including you, Vladimir, how children, the elderly people, are perishing from terrorism in Israel. It was not all that long ago that what you called the Great Patriotic War took place. And it is well documented how during that war the Jews, old people and children, mothers and young pregnant women, young men who had not yet known love, were systematically burnt in ovens, poisoned with gas, and buried alive in common graves. Not just one person, not a hundred, not mere thousands, but millions of people were brutally slain during this brief period. Historians lay the blame squarely on Hitler, but who was to blame back in 11... 13 in Kibi and Rus, when popular hatred of the Jews suddenly boiled over. Jewish houses in Kiev and other parts of, of Rus were plundered and burnt, while Jews, even children, were killed. The people of Rus, caught up by a brutal rage, were ready even to topple the ruling princes from their thrones. And when the princes gathered together within council, they decided to pass a law expelling all Jews from the whole territory of Rus and henceforth letting none in. An order was given to rob and kill any who surreptitiously entered, entered therein. In 1290, there was a sudden move to the effect of the physical extermination of all Jews in England. The rulers were obliged to eject the whole Jewish population from the country. In 1492, Jewish pro pogroms began in Spain. A threat of physical annihilation hung over all Jews living in Spain, and once again they were obliged to leave the land. Right from the moment when the Jews left the Sinai wilderness, they became the target of hatred by peoples of various countries. The hatred kept increasing, and here and there manifested itself in cruel pogroms and murders. I've cited just a few dates of these fearful pogroms. Ones you can easily verify for yourself in histories people have written down. There have been many more conflicts besides for the Jewish people. Any one of them by itself is naturally not as significant as the instances everybody knows about. But when the range of small-scale conflicts is examined as a whole, it takes on an unprecedented scale and proportion. Perhaps the most extreme of all of the most terrifying phenomena in human history. If something like that has happened throughout the millennia, one could conclude that the Jewish people are to be blamed in people's eyes. But what are they to be blamed for? Historians, both ancient and modern, have said that the Jewish people have conspired against authority, that they have aspired to deceive everyone from the least unto the greatest, and in, in the case of the poor, to try to trick them out of a, at least a little, in the case of the rich, to bring them to utter ruin. And this is evidenced by the fact that among the Jews there are many wealthy people capable of even influencing governments. But there is one question you should ask yourself. How righteous are the ones who have been deceived by the Jews? The ones that had amassed such wealth, did they acquire it all by honest means? As for those condemned to be in authority, can we believe them to be so smart if they could easily be so easily deceived? Besides, most rulers are dependent on someone else, as the Jews have demonstrated quite clearly. One could go on exploring this topic for a long time, but the answer is simple. In the occult world, everybody lives by deceit. Then, should we only condemn the one who has succeeded in achieving more than the rest? 
And as far as the Jewish people are concerned, we could easily substitute any one of the other peoples we know today. Any one if they were subjected to the same totally unprecedented programming as the Jews were during their forty years of wandering in the wilderness, heeding only to occultism and not seeing what had been created by God. Jesus tried to remove this programming and save his people. He came up with a new religion for them, one different from what they had before. For example, in contrast to the previous saying, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, he said, Whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. In contrast to the verse which said, God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself. He called his people the servants of God. Jesus could also have told the truth to his people. He could have told them about the Vedic times, about how man was able to live happily in his domain, in contact with the creations of the Father Creator. But the Jewish people were already programmed. They believed only in the occult deeds. Their consciousness was oppressed by the world of the unreal. And so Jesus decided to act in an occult matter himself. He founded an occult of religion. The high priest at the time was able to guess Jesus' intention. The high priest racked his brain for many a year before he found what he considered the smartest solution. There is no point in fighting Jesus' teachings. Through the minds of the soldiers I have selected from among the Jews, I must spread them through all the peoples of the earth while maintaining the old religion for Israel. And so it happened, exactly as the high priest had conceived. And two essentially different philosophies began to coexist. According to one, the Jews are a chosen people, as Moses taught, and all other peoples ought to be subject to them. According to the other, expressed in Jesus' words, all are equal before God, and people should not try to take precedence over others. Instead, one should love one's neighbor and even one's enemy. The priests realized that if the Christian religion, which calls everyone to love and humility, should succeed in spreading throughout the world, and at the same time Judaism, which, which elevates one over the rest, is preserved, the world would be subdued. While the world might bow before the Jews, they are but foot soldiers. The world would actually be bowing before the priest. And the priests, preachers, went out into the world as earnest teachers of the new doctrine. The doctrine of Jesus? Not quite. The priest had by now added a great deal of his own teachings to it. What happened thereafter, you already know. Rome fell. It was not external foes, however, that destroyed the great empire. Rome was destroyed from the inside after adopting Christianity. The emperors were under the impression that Christianity would enhance their power and authority. They were quite flattered by one of the postulates, namely, that all power was derived from God and that the ruler was ordained to the emperor's throne by God's grace. In the 4th century AD, Christianity celebrated its victory in Rome, both officially and in actual fact. In great delight, the high priest gave a silent, non-contact command to the Byzantine emperor, and Christian Rome burnt the library of Alexandria to the ground. Altogether, 700,033 volumes were lost, Bonfires of books and ancient scrolls burnt in many cities. The burnt books were largely from the heathen period, but they also included the few that recorded the knowledge of the Vedic people. These were not burnt, they were salvaged, concealed and studied in turn by a narrow, narrow circle of the devoted, and only afterward were destroyed. It seemed to the high priest that now the people were getting further and further away from a knowledge of their pristine origins. He would encounter no more obstacles on his path. Feeling bolder, he issued yet another tacit command, resulting in the anathema being issued at the Second Council of Constantinople against the doctrine of reincarnation. For what reason, you may ask? To keep people from thinking about the essence of earthly life. To keep them thinking that a happy life exists only beyond the earth's borders. And many peoples of the earth began believing precisely that. The priest was truly delighted. He knew that what would happen next. He construed that since nobody had experienced otherworldly life, man would have no idea of how to reach paradise, the good, or how to avoid ending up in a fearsome hell. So now he would offer 
to man a little occult hint which would favor his own plan. And so the priests have kept on giving out hints to the world which bring benefit to themselves. But they were not able to immediately obtain full power over the world, even when it seemed to them that the strongest bastion of heathen culture, Rome, was destroyed. Even then, there still remained on earth one small island which was impervious to the priests' casual, usual charms. Even back before Rome, even before the appearance of Jesus' teachings, the high priests had aspired to destroy the culture of the last Vedic state, Rus. Chapter 7 The Secret War with Vedic Rus The war with Vedic Rus began long before Jesus' appearance on the earth, long before the fall of Rome. This thousand-year war was not waged with iron swords. Occultism executed its military raids on a non-material plane. Preachers of the occult religion came to Russia. Dozens of their names are mentioned in various ecclesiastical books. But they actually numbered in, in the tens of thousands. They were not to blame for their ignorance. They were fanatics, which meant their mind was unable to fathom even the millionth part of creation. As foot soldiers to the priest, reverently carrying out his orders without so much as a murmur, they attempted to explain to people how to live. They tended to say exactly the same things they had said when preaching to once majestic imperial Rome. They, introduced, they tried introducing ritual and proposed the construction of temples instead of paying attention to nature or earthly existence. Then the kingdom of heaven would come for everyone. I shall not burden you by reciting their sermons. If you wish, you can still read their words today. I shall tell you why, for thousands of years, they did not succeed in doing anything with Vedic Rus. Every other person living in Rus at that time was a poet and a wit. And there were bards in Rus. They were called bayans back then. And this is how it all took place in those times. For decades, the priests' foot soldiers waged a propaganda campaign to the effect that God had to be bowed down to. And here and there, people began to listen and reflect on the message. Upon seeing this, the bayan would simply laugh and make up a parable, which he would then sing, and the parable would quickly spread throughout Russia. And over the next 10,000 years or so, Russ would have a good laugh at the priest's sermons. The priest was furious and launched new attacks, but once again, in Rus, a parable would be born, and Rus would laugh once more. Of all the many parables of those times, I shall tell you just three. In which temple should God dwell? Anastasia's first parable. In one of the many populated settlements on the earth, people went happily about their daily life. In this particular community, lived 99 families. Each family lived in a splendid house decorated with fanciful wood carvings. The garden around the house brought forth fruit every year in abundance. Vegetables and berries grew all by themselves. Every year people met the spring with joyful greeting and delighted in the summer. A series of cheerful friendship celebrations brought forth songs and, and korovods. In the winter time, People rested from their daily exhilarations, and they looked up to the heavens and tried to decide whether they might be able to weave the moon and the stars into even better patterns. Once, every three years in July, those people gathered in a glade at the edge of their community. Once in every three years, God would respond to their questions in an ordinary voice. Even though he remained invisible to ordinary eyes, each one could feel him and he, together with all the residents of the community, decided how best to build their life in the days to come. The people's conversation with God might be philosophical, but sometimes quite simple and even funny. So, for example, one middle-aged man stood up and addressed God this way. Come on now, God, for our celebration this summer, when we all gathered together with the dawn, you decided to drench us all with a monsoon. The rain poured down like a waterfall from heaven, and the sun began to shine only around noon. What did you sleep in? What did you sleep in until noon? 
I was not asleep, God replied. At this morning's dawn I thought about how to make your celebration truly glorified. I saw how some of you on their way to the celebration were too lazy to wash themselves with clean water. How so? Such reprobates would spoil the show with their appearance. And so I decided to first wash everyone, and then have the clouds sweep in and allow the rays of the sun to caress the water-washed bodies with tenderness. Well, okay, that is how the man agreed, brushing off food crumbs from his mustache and wiping the blackberry stains around his son's mouth. Tell me, God, asked an elderly and pensive philosopher, there are many stars shining in the sky overhead. What does their fanciful alignment mean? If I should select a star that is pleasing to my soul, and then, when I get bored with my earthly life, could I remove there with my family? The alignment of the heavenly bodies twinkling in the dark tells us, tells about the life of the whole universe. An alertness in your soul, but without tension, allows you to read the book of the heavens. This book will not open for idleness or curiosity, but only for pure and meaningful thoughts. And yes, you can settle on a star, and each of you can choose for yourself a planet in the heavens. There is only one condition that you must observe. You must become capable of producing on your selected star creations more perfected than those produced on earth. A very young girl jumped up from the ground and tossed her light brown braid of hair over her shoulder. Raising her little face with its turned-up nose heavenward, she placed her hands saucily on her hips and suddenly declared to God, I have a complaint to make to you, God. For two years now I have waited patiently to tell you about it. Now I shall tell you. Some kind of disorder or abnormality is taking place on the earth. All the people are living as people, falling in love, marrying, and being happy. But am I to blame for something? Every year, just as soon as spring arrives, my cheeks break out into freckles. There's nothing that'll wash them off, and I can't paint them over. Did you think this up as some kind of a joke, God? I demand that as of next spring, not a single freckle ever appears on my face again. Oh, my daughter, those are not freckles, but spring speckles that appear on your beautiful little face each spring. But I shall call them as you wish. If you find your freckles to be such an annoyance, I shall remove them come next spring, God answered the spunky girl. But then a handsome young lad got up on the other end of the glade and meekly addressed God, though not in a loud voice. We have a lot of work ahead of us in the springtime. You, God, try to take part in everything we do. Why would you waste your time on removing her freckles? Besides, they are so beautiful that I cannot picture a more beautiful image than a young maiden with freckles in the spring. So what am I to do? God thoughtfully responded. The maiden asked, and I promised her. What's this about what to do? The girl once more broke into the conversation. You heard the people say it's not freckles, but other more important things that we should be concerned about. But while we're on the subject of speckles... I'd like to ask for two more right here on my right cheek so that it's all symmetrical. God smiled. This was evident from the fact that all the people were smiling. Everybody knew that it would not be long before a new splendid family would be lovingly born into their community. So the people lived with God in that remarkable community, and then one day a hundred wise men came to see them. The hospitable residents always greeted guests with all kinds of good things to eat. The wise men tasted their splendid fruit and were amazed at its extraordinary flavor. Then one of them said, O oh people, what a splendid orderly life you lead. You have abundance and coziness in every home, but your communication with God lacks sophistication. There is no glorification or adulation of deity. But why, the residents tried to protest in alarm. We talk with God the way we talk with each other. We talk and reason with Him every three years. But every day he rises with the sun. As a bee, he busies himself around the gardens beginning in every spring. Every winter he covers the ground with snow. His tasks are clear to us, and we are glad for all the seasons. You are doing things the wrong way, said the wise men. We have come to teach you how to talk with God. All over the earth an array of temples and palaces has been built in his honor where people can talk with God every day, and we shall teach you to do the same. 
For three years, the residents of the settlement heeded the words of the wise men. Each of the hundred insisted on his own theory about how to best construct a temple to God and what should be done in the temple each day. Each of the wise men had his own theory. The residents of the community had no idea which of the wise, the hundred wise theories they should choose. Besides, how could they choose without offending the, other, the, offending the wise men? And so they decided to heed them all and build all the temples proposed, one for each family. But there were only 99 families in the village, and there were a 100 wise men. When they heard the decision of all the residents, the wise men became very concerned. It meant one of them would not get his temple built and would not receive the anticipated offerings, and they began arguing among themselves as to whose theory of worshipping God was the most effective, and they began dragging the residents into the dispute. The dispute heated up, and for the first time in many years the villagers forgot about their communication with God. They did not gather as before in the glade on the appointed day. Another three years went by. Ninety-nine magnificent temples were scattered about the settlement, and it was only the villagers' huts that had lost their luster. Some of the vegetables lay uncollected on the ground, and the fruit of the garden began to become infested with worms. This is all because, the wise men preached in various temples, you do not have full faith. Bring more and more gifts to the temple, try harder, and bow down to God more often. But there was one wise man, the one who had been left without a temple, who whispered first to one and then to another, You have been going about everything the wrong way, people. All the temples you have built are of the wrong construction, and you do not worship the right way in your temples. You are not saying the right words as you pray. I am the only one who can teach you how you can communicate with God every day. Just as soon as he managed to bring someone over to his side, a new temple would be erected, and one of the existing ones would fall into disrepair. And again, one of the wise men, the one newly deprived of the people's offerings, tried to surreptitiously slander the others in front of the villagers. A number of years passed. Then, one day, the people remembered about the gatherings they used to have in the glade where they heard God's voice. Once again they gathered in the glade and began asking questions in the hope that God would hear them and give an answer as before. Answer us, how did it happen that our gardens are bringing forth warm infested fruit? And why do our vegetables no longer yield an abundant harvest every year? And why do people quarrel, fight, and argue amongst themselves, but cannot possibly choose the best faith? Tell us, in which of the temples we built for you do you dwell? For a long time God did not answer their questions, and when a voice finally sounded in space it was not a happy voice, it sounded weary. My sons and daughters, the reason for the desolation in your houses and the gardens around them is that I am simply not able to do everything by myself. Everything has been designed by my dream right from the start in such a way that I can create splendor only in conjunction with you. But you have, in part, turned away from your homes with their gardens. Creation is something I cannot ever manage on my own. There must be co-creation by the two of us together. Moreover, I want to say you all, you yourselves include love and freedom of choice, and I am ready to follow your aspirations with my dream. But you must tell me, my dear daughters and sons, in which of the temples I am to dwell. Before me, you are all of equal worth. So whereabouts should I reside so that no one feels left out? When you have decided on your own in which of the temples I should make my home, I shall be glad to follow your collective will. After responding to all, the, to all with these words, God fell silent. The people of the once beautiful village are continuing their conflict even to this day. Their houses are filled with desolation and dust. Around them, the temples rise higher and higher, even as the conflict grows bitterer and bitterer. Well, Anastasia, that is quite an unrealistic fairy tale parable you told. There must have been some pretty dumb people in that settlement. Didn't they realize that God wants to work with each one of them to care for their garden? Besides, you say that those dullards in the settlement are still arguing even today. And where is that settlement? In what country? Can you tell me? I can. Then tell me. 
Vladimir, you along with people from different lands are living in this very settlement right now. Eh? Oh, I see. Precisely. We are the ones. We are still engaged in a dispute about whose faith is better, while our gardens are full of worm-infested fruit. The best place in paradise. Second parable. Four brothers came to a gravesite to honor the memory of their father who had died many years before. The brothers wanted to know whether his soul was dwelling in paradise or in hell. They were all eager for their father's spirit to appear before them and tell how it was doing in the next world. Their father's image appeared before them in wondrous radiance. The brothers were awed and their hearts were afire when they saw this miraculous vision. When they finally regained their composure, they inquired, Tell us, father, does your soul dwell in paradise? Yes, my sons, their father replied. My soul delights in a wondrous paradise. Tell us, father, the brothers started asking, what fate awaits our souls after our own flesh dies? And the father responded to each one of his sons in turn with a question of his own. Tell me, my sons, how do you appraise your deeds to date upon the earth? And each brother answered his father in turn. The elder son began. I have become a great military leader, father. I have defended my native land against its foes and never allowed an enemy foot to tread upon it. I have never offended the poor and infirm. I have endeavored to take good care of the soldiers under my command. I have always honored God, and therefore I hope to enter, enter into paradise. The second son replied to his father, I have become a prominent preacher. I have preached goodness to the people. I have taught them to worship God. I have reached great heights and achieved high standing among my peers, and therefore I hope to enter into paradise. The third son replied to his father, I have become a prominent scientist. I have designed great many devices to benefit people's lives. I have raised a large number of handsome buildings for mankind. Each time I start a new construction project, I give praise to God and to celebrate and honor His name, and therefore I hope to enter into paradise. The youngest brother answered his father, I, Father, cultivate a garden and work daily at raising vegetables. From my splendid garden I send fruits and vegetables to my brothers and try not to do anything dishonorable or displeasing to God, and therefore I hope to enter into paradise. The Father replied to his sons, Your souls, my sons, will indeed dwell in paradise after your flesh dies. The vision of their father faded. Years went by, the brothers died, and their souls met in the garden of paradise. Only the soul of their younger brother was not among them. The three brothers then began to call out to their father, and when he once again appeared before them in his wondrous state, wondrous radiance, they asked him, Tell us, father, why is the soul of our little brother not among us in the garden of paradise? It has been a hundred earthly years since we last spoke with you at our gravesite. Do not be concerned, my sons, replied the father. Your little brother's soul, too, is dwelling in the garden of paradise. Only he is not here with you right now, because your little brother is at this moment communicating with God. Another hundred years went by, and once again the brothers met in the garden of paradise. But again, their younger brother was not with them. And again the brothers called for their father. When he appeared, they asked, See, another hundred years has gone by, but our little brother has not come to meet us, nor has anyone seen him in the Garden of Paradise. Tell us, Father, where is our little brother now? And the father answered his three sons, Your little brother is communicating with God, and that is why he is not among you. And the three brothers began asking their father to show them where and how their younger brother was communicating with God. Take a look, the father replied, and the brother saw the earth, and there was the marvelous garden which their little brother had cultivated during his life. In this wonder wondrous earthly garden, their brother, looking so much younger, was explaining something to his child. His beautiful wife was busying herself nearby. The brothers asked their father in astonishment, This is our little brother in his earthly garden as before, not in the garden of paradise as we are. What is he to blame for before God? Why has his flesh not died? Several centuries have passed in earth years, and here we see him as a young man. 
Does that mean God has somehow changed the order of the universe? And the father answered his three sons, God has not changed the order of the universe, which he established right from the start in great harmony and inspired love. Your, your brother's flesh has died, and on more than one occasion. But the place of one's soul in the garden of paradise is best created by one's own hands and soul. Just as for any loving mother and father, the child of their own creation is always the most glorious. According to the divine order of things, the soul of your little brother should assuredly be granted entrance into the garden of paradise. But seeing this garden is on the earth, it is immediately incorporated into a new body, and the earthly garden so dear to it. Tell us, Father, the brothers went on, you were saying that our little brother is communicating with God, but we do not see God with him in his garden. And the father responded to the, his three sons, Your little brother, my sons, is looking after God's creations, the trees and the grass. They are the Creator's own materialized thoughts. In treating them with love and conscious awareness, your brother is thereby communicating with God. Tell us, Father, Shall we ever return to the earth in fleshly form? The sons asked their father, and they heard him answer. Your souls, my sons, now dwell in the garden of paradise. They can take on earthly form only if someone creates a garden for your souls in the, on the earth, similar to the one in paradise. The brothers exclaimed, Gardens are not created with love for other people's souls. We ourselves, once we are given a fleshly form, shall cultivate a garden of paradise on the earth. But the, the father replied to his sons, You were given that opportunity already, my sons. After this response, the father began to quietly withdraw. But once again the three brothers cried out and asked their father, Dear father, show us your place in the garden paradise. Why do you withdraw yourself from us? The father stopped and replied to his three sons, Look there, do you see that leafy apple tree flowering beside your little brother in his garden? Under that apple tree is a little cradle, and in that cradle is a beautiful body of a tiny infant that has just wiggled its little hand as it begins to awake. My soul is alive in that little body. After all, that was the marvelous garden I began creating myself. The Wealthiest Groom Third Parable I shall make a few changes in this parable to put it in modern-day context. In one village lived two neighbors. The families were friends with each other and enjoyed working their land. Every spring, gardens bloomed on the two plots, and their little groves of trees grew taller. Into each family, a son was born. After their sons had matured, one day, while gathered around a festive table, the fathers took a firm decision and handed everything over to their son's control. Let those sons of ours now decide what to sow and when. One of them said, the, said to the other, And you and I, my friend, shall not oppose them, or even give them hints or questioning looks. Agreed, replied the other. Let our sons even make changes around the house if they wish. Let them choose the clothing they like, and let them decide what livestock and other things to buy. Fine, replied the first. Let our sons become self-sufficient, and let them choose worthy brides for themselves. We shall go together, my friend, to seek brides for our sons. And this is the decision that emerged from the two friends and neighbors' conversation. Their idea was supported by their wives, and the families began living under growing, under their grown-up son's administration. But thereafter, the two families' lives significantly diverged. In one family, the son became an active member of the community and paid his respects to everyone, which led to his being defined as the first citizen of the village. The other son seemed to be slow and serious of mind to all around. He came to be called the village's second citizen. The first neighbor's son felled and sawed up the trees of the grove his father had planted and hauled them to market. He bought himself a family car in place of his horse, along with a small tractor. The first son here was concerned very, considered very enter enterprising. The new entrepreneur calculated that the coming year would see a sharp increase in the price of garlic, and he was not mistaken. He pulled up all his plantings and sowed his fields with garlic. His father and mother did their best to help him in everything. They had made a promise, and it was not forsaken. 
the family sold the garlic at a profit. They set about building a huge mansion using the most modern materials and invented and hired construction workers. And the enterprising son did not relent. He spent from morning till night trying to figure out what the most profitable crop would be to plant in the spring. And by winter's end, he had calculated that the spring's most profitable crop would be onions. And again, he sold his harvest at a profit and bought himself a fancy new car. One day, the two neighbor sons met along the road. One was driving a car, the other a wagon harnessed to a frisky mare. The successful entrepreneur stopped his car and the two neighbors had a conversation. See, neighbor, I'm driving a fancy car while you're getting around in a horse-drawn cart like just like before. I'm building a big house while you are still living in that old house of your father's. Our fathers and mothers have always been friends, and I too am ready to help you in a neighborly way. If you like, I can tell you what is the most profitable crop to plant your whole field with today. Thank you for your willingness to help, responded the second neighbor from his wagon. Only I happen to cherish a great deal my freedom of thought. Indeed, I do. I certainly don't want to encroach on your freedom of thought. It's just that I sincerely want to help you through. I thank you for your sincerity, good neighbor, but freedom of thought is eroded by non-living things. That car, for example, you are sitting in. How can a car erode? It can easily take overtake that old farm cart of yours, and by the time you get to the city, I'll be able to have my business all taken care of, and all thanks to my motor car. Yes, your car, of course, can certainly overtake my wagon, but it requires you to sit behind the wheel and hold it into con hold on to it constantly as you drive, while you as the driver have to keep jerking some kind of stick with your hand and looking continually at the dashboard in the road. Maybe my horse is slower than a car, but it doesn't require any attention and doesn't distract my thought either. If I should take a snooze, the horse will find its way on way home, own way home. You say you have problems with fuel, whereas my horse fills itself up in the pastures over there. Anyway, tell me, where are you in such a hurry to get to in your car? I want to buy some spare parts to keep on hand. I know exactly what could go wrong with my car at any moment. So you know about technology that you can accurately predict all your breakdowns. Yes, I'm pretty good at that. I took special mechanics courses for three years in in all I swatted through. If you recall, I asked you to join me in those courses too. So for three years of your life, you had only this technology to give your thought to, something that can get old and break down. Your horse too will get old and die. Yes, of course, she will get old, but before that happens, she will be able to give birth to a fowl. The fowl will grow and I shall be able to ride him. What is living will eternally serve man, never fear while what is dead only shortens his years. The whole village makes fun of your ideas, remarked the entrepreneur. They all think of me as successful and wealthy, while they see you just sit and live off your father's fortune. Besides, you haven't introduced any new species of trees or bushes on your father's land, not even a bit. But I've come to love these. I've been trying to understand each one's purpose and how they interact with each other. And I've been able to invigorate the ones starting to wither just by looking at and touching them. Now come each spring, everything is blossoming in harmony, all by itself requiring no outside attention. It's just waiting eagerly for summer and then for fall when it will offer up its fruit for the year. Really, friend, I must say you are queer, sighed the entrepreneur. You walk around entranced with your domain, your garden, and your flowers. At the same time, you say, you are giving freedom to your thoughts. Yes, I am. What do you need a free thought for, anyway? What's the point in freedom of thought? So that I can make sense of all the grand creations, so that I can be happier myself and help you. Me? What's got hold of you? I can marry the best girl in the village. Any one of them will go for me. They all want to be rich, live in a spacious house, and ride in my car. Being rich doesn't mean being happy. And being poor? Being poor isn't so good either. So if you're not poor and not rich, then what? You ought to have just enough of everything. Being self-sufficient, that's not bad either. And be consciously aware of what's going on around. After all, it's not by chance that happiness can be found. 
The entrepreneur grinned and quickly went on his way. A year later, the two neighboring fathers got together to talk. They decided it was time to be courting brides for their sons. When they asked them which of the village girls they would like to wed, the entrepreneuring son replied to his father, The daughter of the village elder really appeals to me, father. I would rejoice to have her as my wife. I can see, my son, that you have made an excellent choice. The village elder's daughter is renowned as the most beautiful girl in the county. All the visitors to our village from both near and far are entranced at the sight of her. Mind you, she can be quite capricious. The girl has a mind of her own that even her parents can't figure out. Some people might think her strange. More and more women keep coming to her from various settlements for advice and to be healed of their ills, and they even bring their children to see this young girl. What of it, father? I am made of sterner stuff. In all our village there is no more spacious house or better car than mine. Besides, twice now I have seen her give me long and thoughtful looks. On being asked which of the village girls he most fancied, the second son told his father, I love the village elder's daughter, father. And how does she act towards you, my son? Have you noticed the look of love in her eyes? No, father. Whenever I happen to meet her, she lowers her eyes. Both neighbors simultaneously decided to woo the maiden for their sons. Arriving at their house, they seated themselves sedately. The village elder summoned his daughter and told her, Look, my daughter, two matchmakers have come to see us on behalf of two young lads, each wishing to have you as his wife. The three of us have decided that you should choose from the two. Can you tell us your decision now, or would you like to think about it until tomorrow morning? I have spent many mornings thinking about it in my dreams, father, the young girls quietly said. I can give you my answer right now. So tell us, we are all eagerly awaiting your decision. The beautiful girl answered the matchmakers like this. Thank you, fathers. Thank you all for inquiring. I thank your sons for desiring to join their life with mine. You have indeed raised splendid sons, and it might have been very difficult to choose to which of two destinies I should myself resign. But I do not want to have children, and I want, but I do want to have children, and I want my children to be happy, to stand tall in prosperity, freedom, and love, and so I have fallen in love with the one who is wealthiest of all. The father of the entrepreneur rose to his feet in pride, while the other father sat glumly in his chair. But the girl went over to the second father, knelt down before him, and said, without raising her eyelids, I wish to live with your son. At this point, the village elder rose to his feet. He wanted to see his daughter living in what was deemed by all the richest house in the village, and so he said to her rather harshly, You spoke correctly, my daughter. Your smart reasoning brought gladness to your father's heart. But you, for your part, did not go and kneel before the richest man in the village. Someone else here is the wealthiest. This is he. And the elder, gesturing the entrepreneur's father, added, Their son has built a spacious home, honey. They have a car, a tractor, and money. The girl went over to her father and responded to his harsh and bewildering words. Of course you are right, Papa dear, but I was talking about children. What use will our children have for those things you mentioned? The tractor can break down while they are still growing up. The car may rust and the house fall into decay. That may be. Maybe what you say is true, granted, but your children will have a great deal of money, and they can buy for themselves a new tractor and a new car and new clothes. And just how much money is a great deal, might I ask? The entrepreneur's father proudly stroked his beard and mustache and answered solemnly and seriously. My son has heaps of money, enough so that if he needed to buy three of everything our household already has, he could do so all at once. And those horses our neighbor keeps, we would be able to buy not just two, but a whole stable full. I wish you and your son great happiness, but there is no amount of money on the earth that would buy a father's garden where every branch reaches out in sheer love to the one cultivating it. And no money in the world can buy the loyalty of a steed that has played with a child as a cult. Your domain may indeed make money, but my beloved's domain will make a space for sufficiency and love. 
A change of priestly tactics. During the Thousand Year War, the priest changed his tactics a number of times, but all to no avail. Russ still laughed, and as before, at his occult intrusions. The people referred to those preachers as miserable wretches. At that time, wretchedness was not equated with physical affliction, but with occultism. People in Rus took pity on the wretched preachers. They fed them and offered them shelter, but did not take any of their sermons seriously. After 400 centuries, the priest realized he would never achieve victory over the Vedic land. He accurately determined wherein the extraordinary power of Vedism lay. Vedism was based solidly on a divine culture. Everyone's way of life was divine, and every family created in its domain a space of love. They felt the wholeness of nature and consequently of everything God had created. What happened in Vedism was that people spoke with God through nature instead of bowing down before Him. They attempted to understand Him. They loved God as a son and a daughter loved their kindly parents. And so the priests came up with a plan which would be able to break this dialogue with the divine. To this end, it was necessary to separate people from their domains, from the divine gardens, from their co-creation together with God. It was necessary to divide the whole territory where the Vedic people lived into different states and to destroy their culture. New preachers went to Rus. They put a new approach into practice. This time they sought out people in whom selfishness, pride, dominated even just a little over the other energies of feelings. Whenever they found such a man, they tried enhancing the sense of pride within him. This is how they operated. Imagine a group of stately-looking elders arriving at the home of a happy family. But there is no attempt, as before, to preach or teach them how to live. On the contrary, they all at once bow down before the head of the household, present him with outlandish gifts, and say, In our far-off land we climb to the top of a high mountain, the highest mountain on the earth. Standing at the summit above the clouds, we heard a voice from heaven telling us about you. And it was told to us that you are the wisest of all the people on the earth. You alone were chosen, and we are honored to bow down to you, present you with our gifts, and wait upon your words of wisdom. And if they saw the man taking their bait, they would continue their sly talk. It is your duty to make all other people happy. The voice told us so on the mountain top. You should not waste your valuable time on other concerns. You should be in charge of people and make decisions for them, decisions that, w that have been entrusted to you alone. And here is your heavenly headdress. At this point, a headdress decorated with precious stones was presented to the man as though it were the grandest treasure. And so the headdress was placed upon the head of the man who now believed in his own majesty and his chosen status. And at that very moment, all the visitors fell to their knees before him in great reverence, and they began to praise heaven for the, the honor of being worthy to bow before this majesty. Next, the foreign visitors built him a separate house to live in that looked very much like a temple. This is how the first princes rose to power in Vedic Rus. The new prince's neighbors looked upon this man sitting on his throne in the temple as some sort of curiosity. They watched as the foreign visitors bowed before him, indulged him his every whim, and plied him with all sorts of questions. At first, they took this scenario for some kind of game from overseas, and, and some decided, either out of curiosity or out of compassion, to play along with the foreigners and with their neighbor. But people gradually got drawn into the game, and little by little they sank into a state of serfdom. And without their realizing it, their thoughts turned more and more away from co-creation. It was not easy for the priests' emissaries to get the princedoms established. In the beginning, for more than a hundred years, their attempts proved unsuccessful. But still, it finally came about, and Vedic Rus was carved out into princedoms. And then, events took their natural course. The princes began fighting over who was greater, and dragged their neighbors into Internes, intercene feuds. Later, historians would claim that grand princes arose who managed to join the isolated princedoms of Rus together into one mighty state. But think for yourself, Vladimir. Could that really have been so? And what kind of unification exactly did the historians have in mind? 
It is all very simple in fact. Yes, one prince was able to kill or conquer others, but people can be united only by, by culture and a way of life. The setting up of borders always indicates separation. Once a state was established, not on the basis of a cultured way of life, but on the artificial greatness of one or more people by virtue of their armies, a whole lot of problems immediately made themselves heard. How to maintain those borders and expand them as the opportunity occurred, and so arose the need for a sizable army. A large state cannot be governed by, by one man alone. So clerks and scribes soon appeared, and they have been multiplying each day right up to the present time. The princes, clerks, scribes, merchants, and all their servants together form a category of people who have been separated from God's creations. Today their functional designation is the creation of an artificial world. They have utterly lost the ability to perceive true reality, and so constitute fertile soil for occultism. Only a thousand years ago, Rus was considered pagan. Paganism still carried within itself a lingering sense of the divine Vedic culture. With the advent of the princes and their princedoms, first little princedoms and later large ones, the rulers found they needed a force more powerful than an army. A force capable of creating a type of man inclined to unquestioning submission to authority. Here, too, the priests' messengers came to the ruling prince's assistance and offered them a suitable religion. The essence of this new development was very much to the prince's liking. Though there was hardly anything new in it, it contained everything that Egypt had had five thousand years earlier. Like the pharaoh, the prince was considered to be appointed to his position by God. The occult ministers of the new religion were his advisors, again just as in Egypt. Everyone else was a mere slave. It was not a simple task to inculcate the new order into the minds of free people whose memories could still savor the celebrations of Vedic culture. And so once again the priests came to the prince's aid. His foot soldiers began spreading false rumors to the effect that there were pagan settlements where people were being more and more frequently sacrificed to God. It was noised abroad that pagans sacrificed to their gods not just various animals, but also beautiful girls or young men or even little children. This false rumor is still rampant among us today. More and more it became a source of anger to the pagan people. And now here was this new religion being offered, which placed a strict prohibition on burnt sacrifices. It talked about equality and brotherhood, exempting, of course, the princes. Thus the new religion was little by little introduced into pagan Rus. Eventually, one of the ruling princes decreed that Christianity be recognized as the only true religion in the land. Rus came to be called Christian, and all other religions were banned. Now let anyone whose forebears, mothers and fathers, were called pagan just a thousand years ago ask themselves this question. Did pagans really sacrifice either animals or people to their gods? And the true picture of events will become clear to anyone who is able to do at least nine minutes of logical reasoning. And you, Vladimir, once you have applied your logic to the discovery of the truth, can see the facts for yourself. I shall be glad to give you a little help. First ask yourself a logical question. If pagans, as their accusers claim, actually offered up someone as a sacrifice to, their, to God, then why did the mere rumor about such offerings so greatly trouble their mind and feelings? It would have been more logical in that case to welcome such claims and enthusiastically try to repeat them instead of greeting them with outrage and accepting the new religion's entreaties. But the people were outraged. Why? Naturally, because the pagans could not entertain even the thought of sacrificing animals, let alone people. That is why no one can come up with even a single source in support of burnt sacrifices among the people of pagan Rus. It was only the chroniclers of Christianity that claimed that. But then they never liked they never lived in pagan Rus and did not even know the language of pagan Rus. And what about the sources and manuscripts of pagan Rus itself? Some of them were hidden, some were burnt in bonfires, just as in Rome. What exactly was seditious in those scrolls? What did they disclose? Without being able to read them, everyone today can make their own guess. 
They would have exposed the falsity of the accusations against paganism, and they could have transmitted the knowledge of Vedism. There was more to it than the facts that none of the people of pagan Rus ever indulged in burnt sacrifices. They did not eat meat at all. They could not even imagine such a thing. They were friends with the animals. Their daily diet was varied enough, but it was strictly vegetarian. Who can come up with a single recipe from ancient Rus cuisine that even mentioned meat? No one. Even our epic folk tales tell about how the turnip was respected in ancient Rus, about how the people drank mead beer. Let anyone today, even meat eaters, try drinking this warm mead made from fla flower pollen and herbs. After drinking that, you will not want to eat anything else. It's certainly not meat. Those who force themselves to do so may find the meat will only make them vomit. Besides, judge for yourself, Vladimir. Why should anyone eat meat when all around them food, a whole lot of easily digestible high-energy food was available? During the winter, bees feed on nothing but honey and pollen, and so can go the whole winter without excreting at all. The whole intake is assimilated by the bee's body, and smitten. A drink made with boiled honey was always served to guests directly they entered the home. And who would start eating meat after tasting a sweet drink? It was the nomads that introduced meat to the world. There was hardly any edible fruit to fend for in the prairie lands and deserts they moved about in, and this is why they ended up killing cattle. And the nomads ate the meat of those animal herds that served as their beasts of burden, animals that carried their belongings, fed them with milk, and gave their wool for clothing. Thus the culture of our forebears was destroyed, and Rus was plunged into religion. If the people had learnt genuine religion, purely Christian, it is possible that life would have turned out differently. But the priest managed to inject his own twists into the Christian teachings, and the one religion became subject to various interpretations, and the Christian world became divided into a multitude of denominations, often in conflict with each other. The high priest spent a great deal of effort on Rus. In other places on the earth, people saw that he, what he was doing and did not permit his preachers within their borders. Japan, China, and India did not become Christian, but the high priest won them over by another way. The age of occultism began 1,000 years ago. People all over the earth lived in the age of occultism and are still living in it today.